Welcome this morning. Um, my name is Colin. If you don't know me, uh, along with my wife Kate, we're the leaders of the Horsham congregation here. But wherever you're coming from, whichever congregation or wherever you are coming from, uh, a really warm welcome, especially if you're maybe joining us for the first time this morning, or if you're someone who wouldn't call yourself a Christian. It's great to have you with us. And though maybe some of what I might talk about this morning might maybe go over your head, I believe that God wants to speak specifically and directly to you this morning. So just be listening for his voice. Just be listening to say that, that stirring your heart where you go, this is for me. And I believe that's for all of us. Let's all be doing that and in that place where we're ready to hear what God has got to say for us this morning. Now, before we start, there's something I really want to say to all of you, and that is, I miss you. <laughs> I've been calling lots of you. I know loads of us have been calling each other and that kind of thing. And just there's this, this shared feeling that we just miss meeting together. And I miss being here together or worshipping and praying together in the same room. And I know you do too. And I just can't help but think about that day when we can all come back and meet together. And, and just, you know, in, in that kind of way. And I don't know whether that'll be a gradual thing or maybe one sudden Sunday, suddenly the virus has disappeared and we can all come back, who knows? But I can just picture that Sunday morning. I imagine us all arriving at various buildings and things and to the casual observer, it might look like we're going for the world record for the biggest ever game of Twister because there's so many people just throwing their arms around each other, hugging one another. Getting to the front of the building is going to be like some gladiatorial trial to just make it to the front without all your ribs being broken. You know, we're just going to be just throwing our arms around each other, just saying, I missed you. And I can't wait for that moment. I think it's going to be really a shame, though, for people like like Eurek, building managers, who would normally wait here really patiently for everyone to finish their coffees and conversations and that kind of thing and, and head on out the building because the last person is going to be leaving. They'll turn around and say, bye, Eric, thanks so much, only to realise there's this like thin film of dust covering him and a cobweb hanging from his glasses. You know, over in Crawley, all the kids are arriving for their assembly on Monday morning and people are still like hugging and crying down each other. Over in Worthing, the college have got so fed up trying to clear everyone out of the building. They've just gone and, you know, signed you all up for the, enrolled you in the college. And over in Burgess Hill, Pastor Kevin and Sharon just gave up trying to kick everyone out of the buildings. They just said, come back to our house. Everyone, we'll just come and live in community where we can just keep in touch and hug and pray together all the time. So I just can't wait for that moment where we can all come and be back together. But this year, undoubtedly, whether it's because of that or for myriad other reasons, has been hard. There has been no doubt. And wherever you're at with God this morning, whether you feel like this year has enabled you to come closer to him, or maybe it's been a real trial, you feel you're far from him this morning. I believe this morning God wants to impart to each and every one of us his love, his peace, his hope and his joy. And that's my prayer this morning that all of us, wherever we're at, we would take hold of this gift that he has for us and live in the good of it. Now, love, hope, peace and joy are typically taught and preached about and spoken about at Advent. And we've, though we've been doing them in the wrong order, have been doing that these last couple of weeks. Pastor Colin speaking about love a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Clive last week on hope. And this morning we're focusing on peace. Now, it seems appropriate to be talking about peace at Christmas time uh, because Christmas is, of course, a time of giving. Now, the peace we're talking about is not this. If, if you all kind of join with me and close our eyes and just rub our earlobes and say, woo sa, woo sa. No, that is not the kind of peace we're talking about. The kind of peace we're talking about might be demonstrated really beautifully in Romans 16, 20, where it says, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. This peace is powerful, we're talking about this morning. The picture I have of that is sort of like us sat in this beautiful first class cabin on a, like a speedy train on the line that is called the love of God and in a carriage called the peace of God. And the devil himself jumps out in front of the train wanting to derail it, not realising that he's only a mosquito splatting against the windshield of the train. This God of peace is going to crush him under our feet. He's not a God of war in a shout. Although he is, but you know, that's not what it says. It's this God of peace. There's a peace and a tranquility that God wants to bring in our lives that's going to crush the enemy under our feet. Amen. And again, it seems appropriate to be talking about this at Christmas. Of course, um, peace is a gift. Jesus says in, um, in Luke, he says, do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. And we know, of course, that that kingdom is a kingdom of righteousness, peace and joy. Jesus said in, uh, in John 14, 26, that my peace, 27, sorry, my peace, I leave with you my peace, I give to you, not as the world gives. So he gives us this gift of peace. 
Jesus himself was a gift. And we use these kind of popular um, uh, Christmassy verses at Christmas, talking about these prophecies about the coming of Jesus. For unto us a child is born, and he'll be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. The angels, when they declared to the shepherds about the coming of the Christ, they said, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, good will toward men. This gift that God wants to give us is this gift of peace, but it's not like a Michael Bublé CD. It's not just for Christmas. It's a gift of peace he wants us to live in and walk in ongoing. And so today we're going to unwrap that gift of peace, if you like, explore it a little bit. What does it mean for our lives and how do we live in the good of it? Now, I remember when I was a young boy growing up in the 90s that one of the things that excited me the most about Christmas time and knew that Christmas was really coming near was, of course, that book of dreams, the Argos catalogue. As Bill Bailey would say, laminated so that it can catch the tears of joy from the children as they weep over the back quarter of the book full of all the toys that they may one day hope to possess. And I remember with my brother flicking through the, the pages of the Argos catalogue at the back there, going through all these different toys. And to be honest, we didn't really want most of them. We just enjoyed looking at the pictures and thinking what might they be like. But I remember one year we both saw these skateboards and neither of us have ever skated before and we were probably too young to really be skateboarding, but we saw these skateboards and we were like, this is what we want. We ran to our parents and said, this is what we want for Christmas, a skateboard each. And um, I was thinking to myself, you know, I'm going to be kick flipping and ollieing in no time and it's going to be so much fun and I'll skate to school and it'll be the best thing ever. And my parents are sat there, they give that look to each other, that knowing look that, you know, as a parent now myself, I understand to be that's not going to be how it goes at all. They're never, they're going to, they're going to take one look at this and then never use it ever again. Are you sure this is what you've wanted for Christmas? Yes, I'm so sure. I've never been sure of anything more in my entire life, please. And so we, Christmas Day arrived, we tore off the wrapping paper and my skateboard was white with a turquoise knight on it, holding an axe, very cool looking with luminous hot pink wheels on it. It was the 90s, what can I say? And uh, it was the coolest thing I'd ever got until I took it outside in the wet and the cold, of course, to ride it for the first time. It had no grip tape, which meant you would slide off it as soon as you stepped atop it, and uh, it was basically a death trap. But also, the bearings on this cheap children's skateboard were so bad that you had to be going down like a 45 degree incline for it to actually roll. Otherwise, you'd put your foot down, push, and it would be like as if there were no wheels. It would kind of and that was about it. And so, suffice to say, it, of course, within a couple of weeks ended up at the back of the garage gathering dust and never to be seen again. This is not like the gift that God wants to give us of peace. It is not something that we relegate to the back of the garage of faith, that something we go, oh, this is lovely, thanks so much, and then put aside. This is something that God wants us to dwell in, abide in, and for it to abide in us. And again, this year, has been hard. It's been a year of loss for probably all of us, whether that's a loss of job or a loss of freedom, maybe just a loss of routine or a loss of relationship. For some, it's even been, been the loss of a loved one. There's no doubt that this year has been really a tough one. I know lots of people are going to be staying up on the 31st of December not to see in the new year, but to make sure we see out the old one. You know, this has been a hard year. And there have been times I found it hard and I've struggled. And there have been times where I've had to kind of seek God for something, almost to go rummaging in the garage of faith, so to speak, to say, God, I feel like something's missing. I feel like I've lost something. What is it? Where is it? And only in that exploring things with him and, and, and asking him and seeking him, have I kind of uncovered behind an old skateboard gathering dust in the back of that garage, so to speak, peace. But the thing that saddened me is that I almost hadn't even realized that it had been missing. And what saddened me further is to find that it too may have gathered a thin layer of dust. But of course, that's not where it stays. God says, if that's been the case, if you've lost your peace, take it, take it to heart. Today, let's Say, so, sorry, Father, that I've, I've put this amazing gift aside. I want to step into it again. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. We might feel like we're the disciples at times, 
uh, on the Sea of Galilee, a storm raging, and bit by bit, as we're losing sight of the horizon and of the coast, starting to feel more and more unsettled, less and less peaceful, as we can only begin to catch glimpses of what normality and safety look like between these raging cataracts of waves all around us. And sometimes I've kind of felt like, I don't know about you, like, at what point did I lose that peace? Or to what extent? And today, as I say, we're going to focus on that innermost peace, that abiding peace, how to not lose it, how to not forget it, how to live in the good of it and the best of it that God has for us. The key scripture we've got today is John 16, 33. Now, this might sound really familiar to you. I'm going to read it from the NIV. It's, Jesus says this, speaking to the disciples. A time is coming and in fact has come when you will be scattered, each one to your own home. You will leave me all alone, yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble or tribulation in the King James. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Now that might sound really familiar, been scattered each to your own home. Now, that's not in the sense of leaving Jesus. You know, we didn't choose that or anything like that. Jesus was talking in the, in the context of um, the disciples leaving him as he went to the cross and about uh, persecution that was coming. But it seems really apt, right, for today, for this context of a pandemic where we've been scattered each to our own home. And of course, that word tribulation there, which means trial or distress or suffering and experience that tests one's endurance, patience, or faith. And I don't know about you, but there have been a lot of times where this year has felt like a tribulation, testing our endurance. How strange it is then that it is in this context, this context of speaking about tribulation and battle, of course, Jesus saying that I've overcome, that Jesus promises peace. Alexander uh, McLaren, who is a 19th century Baptist minister, an amazing expository preacher. He was just phenomenal. I really encourage you, if you like studying the Bible, go and read his commentaries with his expositions. Amazing. And he talks about this verse in his commentary, his exposition on John 16:33, about the bifurcation of our Christian faith, our walk in Christ, becoming these, these twin roots I in Christ and I in the world, and how on the surface they seem diametrically opposite in, in their predicates and characteristics. They're diametrically opposed, completely disparate. And yet Jesus brackets them together and brings them together, even informing one another that we have this peace despite and in the midst of tribulation. And I'm going to ask Tim to begin to play. Tim was playing the keyboard earlier. And I just felt to ask him to play while we're talking about this stuff, because God wants to not just, we're not just going to talk about peace or do a Bible study about peace today, but I believe God wants to impart his peace, to give this gift of peace afresh to each and every single one of us. And there's a big difference between a peaceful atmosphere, a, a peaceful track that we could play, and someone who is ministering peace, someone who is praying peace, someone who's playing and expressing the peace of God. And I know Tim is anointed, he's got the Holy Spirit resting on him. And as he plays and, and as we share the word, may God minister his peace to you this morning. And I want to read this extract from Alexander McLaren's commentary. And I want you to, if you would, close your eyes for a moment and see if you can picture this. Imagine this, whatever your circumstances have been, however tough, how tough this year has been, whether you see it as a strong wind, a stormy weather about us, or maybe a battle surrounding us where we are encamped, have this picture in mind. Jesus promises a peace which coexists with tribulation and disturbance, a peace which is realized in and through conflict and struggle. The tree will stand with its deep roots and its firm bowl unmoved. The wildest winds may toss its branches and scatter its leaves. In the fortress, beleaguered by the sternest foes, there may be, right in the very centre of the citadel, a quiet oratory through whose thick walls the noise of battle and the shout of victory or defeat can never penetrate. 
so we may live in a center of rest, however wild may be the uproar in the circumference. In me, peace. That is the innermost life. In the world, tribulation. That is only the surface. I love this beautiful picture of just being in this, this oratory, this little quiet chapel in the midst of the fortress, utterly at peace, no matter what is going on around us. I think I've made the mistake this year of wanting God to change the circumstances so that I can have that peace. You know, let the virus go away, let me go back to doing what I love and with the people that I love and with a routine that is comfortable and safe. And all the meantime, God has been saying, Colin, I want to change you, not the situation. Although I do believe God does want to change the situation. He does want to change us first and foremost. Again, if we look at that picture of Mark 4 of the disciples in the boat with Jesus, the storm is raging all about them, this squall, the wind and rain and the salt water of the waves hitting against their faces and they're terrified and they look to one another and they think, who can save us? They run and they wake up Jesus who is asleep in the stern of the boat on a cushion throughout all of this and they say, Master, save us, don't you care? We're going to drown, we're going to die. And of course, Jesus gets up and I imagine not in some big booming voice, but just in a quiet authority, commands the waves and the wind cease and they stop. And of course, the disciples were looking for the situation to change before they could feel that peace again, that safety. But Jesus, cocooned in the love and the peace of the Father, slept soundly, sweetly, peacefully on a cushion amidst it all. And that's the kind of peace that God wants to instill in us and for us to live in, the peace that lets us sleep through the storm, no matter how, how strong the storm rages we'll stand firm. True peace then is not pretending that the situation is not bad, but being still and holding firm to the promise of God despite the situation being bad. So how do we live in this peace that Jesus did? There is a, a, a a little clip in a film that I absolutely love. I'd show it, but we'd probably get the stream taken down because of copyright issues. So I'm going to quote it for you. But it's from Evan Almighty, and it's one of my favorite films, from favorite clips from scenes from any film. And it's where Morgan Freeman, who is playing God, the part of God, although in this case, seemingly just a waiter in a restaurant, comes and asks this lady, what's wrong? And uh, they have this, this exchange. She says, all this is going wrong and all these problems in my family. And Morgan Freeman, God says to her, sounds like an opportunity. I wish I could do his voice. I can't, I can't, I won't try. It would be awkward. He says, this sounds like an opportunity. Let me ask you something. If someone prays for patience, do you think God gives them patience? Or does he give them the opportunity to be patient? If they pray for courage, does God give them courage? Or does he give them opportunities to be courageous. If someone prayed for their family to be closer, do you think God zaps them with warm, fuzzy feelings? Or does he give them opportunities to love each other? Well, I've got to run, a lot of people to serve, enjoy, and that ends the scene with this woman just with this look on her face of, oh. Now, I know none of us asked for this opportunity. Nobody was praying, God, please send a global pandemic. But it's where we are, whether we like it or not. And we don't know, even with the ideas of vaccines on the horizon, things we don't know how long that this will last. And do we want to be those people that are waiting and waiting and waiting, maybe our faith dwindling and dwindling and dwindling, as we're trying desperately just to hold on long enough for things to get back to normal? Or are we gonna be those people that find that peace amidst the storm? There's another quote from a, a, a great actor, most famously known for playing Superman, Christopher Reeve, when he was interviewed about a riding he ac accident he had that left him paralyzed. He said this, suffering is inevitable. Misery is a choice. And we can't choose the situation that we're in right now, but we can choose our response to it. 
And I'm not saying, please, 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 I'm not saying that's an easy choice, but it is one that Jesus wants to lead us into. So let's look then at what we've got to help us walk into this peace. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. Thank God for the Spirit who produces in us love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. The Spirit that brings peace, the Spirit of peace. Now, because the Holy Spirit wants to grow all these things in us, these fruits in us, it's important that we have good soil. And if we are spending our time at the moment, maybe uh, listening to kind of music or watching the kind of movies that are anything but peaceful, then we're probably not helping um, our lives be rooted in soil that's full of nourishment and good things for us to see peace grown in us. Amen. So that's maybe something to think about. There's this verse in Romans 8 that says, the mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. So how can we know if, if something's maybe poisoning the well, so to speak, or something that's not good in us that, that God's saying, let's just lose this and let me give you in part more of my peace. A bit of teaching that Pastor Colin gave that I heard many years ago, I think when I was at the Bible College, that absolutely changed my life and the way that I live my life was this simple statement, follow the peace. And what he was talking about was when you've got a big decision to make, and who knows that, well, for me at least, a lot of sometimes angst, anxiety or worry can come from big life decisions. Do I take this job or that job? Do I ask her to marry me or not? You know, is this the right thing or not? Is it the best thing or not? What do I do? And what Pastor Colin said was, we have this Holy Spirit who's the spirit of peace. He leads us into peace. So let him speak to us. So nice and easy, if you've got your two decisions to make, just pick one. Just pick one, choose one, and live with that decision for a week. Move towards it. This is the decision I've made and I'm moving towards it. This is where I'm headed now. And if while the, through that week, you just have unrest, you just don't have that sense of peace. You just go, mm, I'm not sure this is quite right. It probably wasn't right. It probably wasn't the right decision. So you make the other decision. You say, okay, for the next week, this is the decision that we're making. That one didn't seem right, this is and you move towards it. And throughout the week, as you do, you have that sense of, yeah, this is right, this is right. You follow the peace. And I can testify that to the fact that every time I've done this, every time I've followed the peace, it has led to the best decisions I've ever made in my life. The decisions of, should I put an offer on this house or not? Is there something else that God got, has God got for me? Is this the right job to take? Is this the right time? Should I ask this, this girl out? Should I ask her to be my wife? And every time I've followed the peace, it has been the best decision of my life. Where I've not followed the peace, it's usually been quite messy. And I wanna also say that just because it's where the peace is doesn't mean it's the easy choice. In fact, more often than not, it seems the hard choice. I'm not saying, by the way, my lovely wife at home, I'm not saying you were the hard choice, just to clarify. But more often than not, it's the hard choice and it can seem the one that seems illogical. Over here, this seems right, it makes sense, it's got a great paycheck or it's got a whatever it might be, all the reasons why, and yet over here it seems hard, it's further away or whatever, it seems difficult. And yet, if there's the peace there, it's the right thing, follow God. So that's our first top tip. How do we walk in this peace? Follow it, follow the Holy Spirit, the spirit of peace. Allow him to speak to us. And whether it's about the big decisions or the small things, God, I sometimes look at a movie comes up on a Netflix playlist and my wife would go, oh, that looks good. And then we both just go, no, it's not. Don't know why. We just, just go, nah, not, not for us. There's just a piece that goes, this will unsettle you. Don't watch it. Another great thing I found has been really helpful for me is just stopping sometimes, especially if I'm recognizing I'm feeling a bit stressed and just focusing on that still small voice, just focusing on God and I do that through just breathing just a deep breath in and a deep breath out and it's like I'm breathing in the Holy Spirit that ruach that breath of God God come and fill me with your peace I'm just breathing out anxiety or worry or anything like that stress and one of the things I love to picture 
is just as the disciple John did when he was at the table with Jesus, reclining with him, he had his head against the chest of Jesus. And I just imagine in that safe place, just hearing the heartbeat of Jesus, just my breathing, just coming into line with his gentle, peaceful breathing, unperturbed by whatever's going around on around him. And just finding that, that peace in the citadel, you know, in the fortress. And I find that really, really helps just, <sighs> Jesus, what do you want to say in this moment? Another thing that's really helpful is understanding what God is saying in, to us through John 16, 33. Jesus doesn't say, you have peace. He says, I tell you these things that in me you may have peace. He shows, shows us these two conditions for peace. Firstly, that it's peace, if we have it at all, in him. Not peace like the world gives. He says this in John um, 14, 27 again, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives. The peace the world gives is fleeting. It is fake, it's false, it's shallow. The peace the world gives is often wrapped in distraction, pretending that the problem isn't there or putting off for another time. That might look like binge eating, it might look like drinking, it might look like binge watching a TV show on media on Netflix or something like that. It might look like finding a new project to occupy us or obsessing over the latest gadget. It might look like um, getting caught up in a relationship. It could be all of these things, which in of themselves, many of those things are not wrong at all. In fact, they could be really positive and healthy and helpful for us, but not if the reason for them is to try and substitute the peace of God with something the world can give. True peace is only found in him. There's also an element that anything of the world is only going to be a distraction. It draws us down the mountain, it draws us out of the citadel, out of the fortress, away from Jesus, the source of our peace. And Jesus, of course, in this, is inviting us when he says, peace in me, is to abide in him. This whole chapter is following on from John 14 and 15 and, and is kind of in one with John chapter 15 especially. And Jesus is talking all about abiding, abiding in me, in the vine. He's talking about this relationship where we are in him, in Christ and Christ in us. He wants us to come find our rest in him, like a fortress safe from attackers, like a port in the storm, to rest our heads against his chest, to hear his heartbeat. This is something that Pastor Clive talked about last week, about just coming to him and being honest, coming and being real. And if you found that really hard or maybe felt maybe a bit of ashamed that maybe it's been a while, wherever you've been at, to come to Jesus and just be honest and be real and say, Jesus, this is where I'm at. I want to take a step towards you. And as we do, as we take that tiny step in the seeking, we find. In the seeking we find, and Jesus rushes to us in his peace, his robe upon our shoulders, the ring on our fingers. The prodigal has returned. My son who is dead is now alive. He rushes to us with his spirit, with his life, with his peace, and in his gentleness to completely change and turn around, not the situation necessarily around us, but the situation that has been going on inside us. I want to read another quote from Alexander McLaren that says this, we are in him as an atmosphere. In him, our true lives are rooted as a tree in the soil. We are in him as a branch in the vine, in him as the members in a body, in him as the residents in a house. We are in him by simple faith, by the true trust that rests upon him, by the love that we find all in him by the obedience that does all for him. And it is only when we are in Christ that we rest and realize peace. The second condition that we find in John 16, 33 is Jesus says, I say these things that you may have peace. There's something of his word, the importance of his word, and having this rock, this word that we can stand upon, where we find peace. And I know that where I've lost sight of his word, that's where I've lost peace. But where I've held onto it, where I know what he's saying, that is where I have found that peace is the most tangible. And if you've been finding peace maybe elusive, 
then I encourage you to get into his word. Maybe just read all of the verses that you can find about peace would be a great start. Find one that jumps out to you, that you just go, this is for me, and stand upon it, meditate on it, say it out loud over and over again, put it on your fridge, stick it on your mirror, stick it on your bedside table. Stand upon his word and we find peace. We, we recognize its closeness, his closeness. Now this abiding, this seeking is active, it's not passive. Um, 1 Peter 3.11 talks about seek peace and pursue it. 2 Timothy 2.22 says, flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love and peace. Philippians 4, 6 and 7 is about coming to God, praying and worshipping. And when we do this, God's peace will guard our hearts and our minds. Though it's really important to stress that this peace is not something we have to attain or strive for. Again, it's in the seeking that we find. As soon as we start that step towards seeking, seeking God for who he is, then we find him and everything he's got for us. Finally, I want to end this kind of section is talking about innermost peace with this final quote from Alexander McLaren and and I love this and again just he's, he's an amazing wordsmith that just paints these beautiful pictures through the scripture and I th just think this is beautiful let us try to keep the roots of our lives in contact with that soil from which they draw all their nourishment and to wrap ourselves round with the life of Jesus Christ which shall make an impenetrable shield between us and the fiery darts of the wicked. Keep on the lee side of the breakwater and your little cock boat will ride out the gale. Keep Christ between you and the hurtling storm and there will be a quiet place below the wall where you may rest, hearing not the loud winds when they call. These things have I spoken that ye may have peace in me. There have been times in my life where I have seen the evidence of this, this work that God does in us of peace. I remember a few years ago, someone who I really loved dearly was given a uh, pretty terrible diagnosis, cancer diagnosis, and all around, friends and family were, 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 were really upset, of, of course, were really upset. There was tears, there was fear, there was worry, there was anxiety. And yet I noticed this really strange response in me that I was concerned, of course, but it didn't rock me. There was a peace in there and knowing that I just knew that I knew they're gonna be okay. There's no need to be upset or to be fearful or to worry, they're gonna be okay. There's a, this peace that abides, affects us. It affects the way we respond. It affects the very character and nature of who we are as we begin to live like Jesus, asleep in the boat, cocooned in that love and peace of the Father. But this peace is not just for us and it would be great to be able to have opportunity to go through maybe another whole message about not just this inner peace but outer peace, the peace that is not just for us that affects the, the inner man but the peace that is for others that affects others. And I'm just going to very briefly read through some scriptures just to, to maybe reflect upon and ponder upon in the week. We're called to be peacemakers not peacekeepers, not maintaining the peace, you know, not just being agreeable so that no one falls out with us or so that we don't, you know, upset anybody, but peacemakers, something deeper, something more important, something that maybe contends for peace, that says, I don't agree with that. And even though you might be upset with me, it's more important that we deal with the root of this and that we settle it than I just go, <laughs> yeah, and you know, just be agreeable. We're called to be peacemakers. James 3.18 says, peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of peace. Matthew 5.9 says, blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called children of God. Romans 12.18 says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Ephesians 4.3, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Romans 14.19, let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification. It's an important thing that we don't just have peace in of ourselves, but we have peace with those around us. We make peace with those around us. And again, it would be great to have more time to sort of talk about that. We don't today, but just you might want to go back and just look at through some of these scriptures another time. There's also this picture painted throughout the, the Gospels and throughout the, the epistles about peace being something that's tangible. 
Jesus again says in John 14 that he says, my peace I leave with you. In Matthew 10, 13, Jesus talking to disciples says, if the home that you've gone to is deserving, let your peace rest upon it. If it is not, let your peace return to you. There's something of leaving peace behind, of changing the atmosphere where we have been. Of course, in uh, Romans 15, 13, it says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. There's an overflowing of this peace and this hope and joy to those around us. And lastly, Ephesians 6, 15 says, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. There's something of carrying the gospel that comes from peace, that we're to leave peace upon those that we meet and are on our households. People walk into homes, that, and I'm so blessed that people have said to us so many times coming to a home, it feels so peaceful in here. You know, it's not because we've got a Yankee candle burning in the corner, it's because the Holy Spirit is there. There's something of his peace. And I wanna, I think it's important just to mention that as we come into the Christmas period, because for so many of us, Sometimes this can be a really hard time to maintain our peace in. Maybe whether it's going to see family or maybe especially this year with the whole Christmas bubble situation is causing, it's causing tensions. I know that that's the story I've heard from lots of people. It's just difficult that don't just be someone who's looking to maintain your peace, but someone who carries peace into that situation. Just like those opportunities we talked about earlier in Evan Almighty, it's the Holy Spirit, would you help me Enable me to see this as an opportunity and let you grow peace in me, not just for myself, but that I would leave peace with those around me. So let's take a moment to respond this morning. And again, it's my prayer that as we've been looking at the word, as we've been focused on this, as, as Tim's been playing and just ministering in that way to us, that whew, the weight of the world has just slid from your shoulders, that the worry and depression, anxiety is lifting and has been over these last minutes that right now, wherever you are, whatever is going on, even if you've got kids running around you and the kettle's boiling and you know, a phone is rigging, right now, settle yourself in that citadel of peace in that quiet chapel, in the center of everything, in the heart of Jesus. And let's re begin to respond. Talk to God. This might be really hard, but I believe we need to make a decision to see this current situation as an opportunity. This might be the hardest thing to do, where all we might want is desperately for it to end to say, God, let me see this as an opportunity for you to work in me. And you might be saying, but Colin, I don't want this opportunity. I never asked for this opportunity. I wish things were different. I understand, believe me, I agree. <laughs> and yet we can choose, do we claw our way through it, waiting for something to hopefully, maybe one day change? That's similar to that hope message Pastor Clyde was talking about last week. Or do we find our hope and our peace right now in the stillness of God who is here with us now, not when things are over? God, help me see this as an opportunity and to stop living out of my strength, trying to claw through it, but to live in your strength and abiding peace. Father, forgive me for trying to fill what only you can fill with other things, with distractions. I'll come back to your heart right now. I choose to take a step towards that abiding. <sighs> Jesus, I choose to lean against you. And maybe as a bit of a a prophetic act, let's right now, let's just take that breath and breathe in the breath of God, that life-giving breath, the breath that gave life to Adam and Eve, that gives life to our very beings, just breathing in. Thank you, Jesus, for your life in me, your peace, and breathing out anxiety, fear, depression, go. That shalom, that complete 
well-being filling my being. And Holy Spirit, next time I come to that place that might be difficult, that might push my buttons, that might find really hard, show me that it's an opportunity for you to work peace in me, to also be peace that affects others and changes their lives too. And finally, if you're someone who wouldn't call yourself a Christian, you can talk to God in this, you can pray to him. Jesus, through the shedding of his blood, through dying on the cross, made it possible for us to have peace with God. And if you've been wrestling with God, battling with God, saying, no, I want to do my own thing, do it my way. And yet, you know, in your heart of hearts, God is saying, but I've got so much better for you. Please surrender and do it my way. Then right now you can say, take that first step and say, God, okay, enough is enough. I give up. I surrender. Over to you. I want to have peace with you, God. And if you pray that prayer, please let us know, drop us an email, info at kingdomfaith.com and I would love to get in touch with you or or Pastor Rohan or one of the other guys here, get in touch with you and just pray through with you and and share more about what this decision means and the, the fullness of life, not just peace, but love, joy, hope that is found in Christ. And finally, I want to read this verse again, John 16, 33, this time in the Amplified and speak it over you in Jesus' name. These are the words of Jesus. I have told you these things so that in me you you may have perfect peace. In the world you have tribulation and distress and suffering, but be courageous, be confident, be undaunted and be filled with joy. I have overcome the world. My conquest is accomplished. My victory is abiding. Have an amazing week filled with the presence and the abiding peace of Jesus. Amen.